Welcome to the capstone project for the Academic English Writing Specialization. By now you have taken four courses and have learned the basics of good writing, how to write academic essays, and how to do research. In this capstone project, you will put all of those skills to use as you plan your essay, research your topic, and write the research paper. You will have several deadlines to meet in the coming weeks. These deadlines are designed to keep you on schedule and allow you to get feedback from your peers. This will help you to be successful. Remember that research and writing take lots of practice and lots of time. You'll need to repeat steps and you'll sometimes feel like you're going in circles. But if you work hard and don't give up, you'll be proud of what you accomplish. In this lesson, you're going to learn what plagiarism is. Plagiarism is using someone else's words or ideas as your own. That can be done either on purpose or it can be accidental. If you use someone else's words or ideas for any reason, you're committing plagiarism. Let's look at an example. On the left side here, we have a source. This is from an article, and the student wants to use part of this in his essay. On the right side here, we have the student's writing. This is what the student put in his own paper and turned in for a grade. Take a minute and read and compare the two. Remember, pretending that someone else's words are yours is not okay. That's plagiarism. Let's look at how this student plagiarized. Compare the colored words here. On the left, I highlighted something that's blue, and on the right side, I made it pink to show you how the student changed a few words. Instead of starting with calling gun violence, the student started with because gun violence. He's trying to make his writing look different, but it's clear that he is copying from the source. Just because he changes a few words does not make this okay. He is plagiarizing because he took words and ideas and did not give credit to the original author. Look at this other example. Again, on the left, we have an original source, and on the right, we have the student's writing. Can you find some places where the student has plagiarized?
Again, this student thought he could change a few words to make his writing look different. But it is clear that his writing is copied from the original source. He can change some words, but he needs to cite the source. And we can still find places in black where the student is using the exact same words as the original source, and the student doesn't put those words in quotation marks to show us that they're someone else's words. The student also does not tell us the name of the source. So this looks like those words are all the student's words. The student is pretending that all of these words are his because he didn't cite the source. So to summarize, remember the things that you cannot do. You cannot change some words to make it look different from the original source. You also cannot use the exact words from that source without putting quotation marks around them. And you cannot follow the same grammar as the original source. All of these things make plagiarism, which you don't want to do. So now you know what the problem is, we need to talk about how you can avoid this so that you don't commit plagiarism in your writing. This lesson is on how to avoid plagiarism. Here's the definition of plagiarism. It is using someone else's words or ideas as your own. It doesn't matter if you intend to use the words or if you accidentally use the words. If you use someone else's work, it's still plagiarism. Here's an example of a student committing plagiarism. You see that the words that are black are exactly the same as those black words in the original. And the pink words are the student's different words that they used, but they're almost the same, and the grammar is exactly the same as the original source. And remember, the reason why this is plagiarism is because the student is pretending these are his own words. He did not cite his source, even though he obviously took from this source on the left. So now we're going to talk about some ways to prevent plagiarism. First of all, you have to put quotation marks around any words that you borrow from another source. Then you have to use in-text citations. That means you give credit to your source. You say where you got those words that you borrowed. So let's look at an example. This is the first way that you can prevent plagiarism when you're borrowing words from another source. You can use a direct quote with attribution. Take a moment to read this. Pause the video if you need more time. Over here on the left, you can see the source information. Gregory Twachman is the author of those words on the left. So when the student uses this information in his essay, he chooses here to use attribution. Attribution just means using the author's name in the sentence or saying where the source comes from. And notice that after the attribution, we have the quote. And notice that the quoted words are exactly the same and we put quotation marks around them. Now it's very clear that these are not the student's words. They come from another source. And it's clear to see what that source is because of the attribution. Now the student is not plagiarizing. The second way to prevent plagiarizing when using someone else's words is to use a direct quote but without attribution. And that's what this student does. The student does not mention the author's name in the sentence. See if you can tell what they did. Take a minute to read and you can pause the video if you need to. 
the student still put quotation marks around all of the parts that is borrowed from the original source. But instead of using attribution, that means instead of introducing the author in the sentence, the student put the in-text citation at the end of the sentence. And notice here it's in parentheses and it goes before the period. This is also a correct way to give credit to the other source. So here the student is not plagiarizing either. This is the third solution to plagiarizing. So this is the third choice that you have as a way to avoid plagiarism. Take a minute to read this and see what the student did. You can pause the video if you need to. Here the student used attribution again, so he mentions the writer's name in his sentence, but this time there's no quotation marks. That's because the student used paraphrase. Paraphrase means to change the words and grammar, but not change the meaning. So the student used his own words and grammar to repeat the idea of the source. But when the student does that, he still has to give credit to the original source. The student cannot pretend that this was his idea because he got it from another source. So he uses attribution to give credit to that source. Again, this student is not plagiarizing. This is a correct use of another source. And here's the fourth option. Pause the video while you read this. As we said, this is without attribution. So the student gives credit to the original source at the end of the sentence. This is a paraphrase, so there are no quotation marks. And notice that the grammar and vocabulary are mostly different. That makes this a paraphrase. And the student used the in-text citation at the end of the sentence instead of using attribution. This is a correct way to give credit to the original source. Now let me say one more thing about paraphrasing. You probably noticed that there are some words here that are exactly the same as the original source. The rule is that in your paraphrase, it's okay to have a word or two that are the same as the original source. You just cannot have more than three words that are the same. If you have more than three words that are the same, then you need to use quotation marks. Just like everything else with writing, it takes practice to know how to use an in-text citation, but it's very important that you do this so that you don't get into trouble with plagiarism.
This lesson is about choosing a research topic for your research paper. In American colleges and many other colleges as well, it is common to have to write a research paper. While there are many differences between different research assignments, there are a few things that they have in common. Most research papers explore complex issues. Because they're complex, they're often very long, maybe 10 pages or more. And they also require that you use outside sources to support your ideas. These things are all common with research assignments. However, no two research assignments that you get will be the same. Research papers differ by department or field of study. In other words, the math department's research paper will be very different from the history department's research paper. Also, different teachers will have different research assignments. They'll have different rules that they want you to follow. There'll be different page links. There'll be different requirements for the sources that you use. Some of them will want you to just evaluate information. Some of them will want you to come up with ideas of your own. Some of them will want you to synthesize articles that you read. It all just depends on the teacher and the department that you're studying in. Here is one example of a research assignment, and this is for an English class. It's just a freshman English class. That means composition. A lot of times a teacher will give a purpose. They will always give the requirements for the assignment and possibly the deadlines or due dates. You can see that these students will be required to write 10 to 11 pages and they're using MLA format, so it'll be double-spaced and 12-point font. And they're being required to use a minimum of five academic sources and no more than 10 sources. Look at the due dates here. Oftentimes for a research paper, there will be several due dates. The teachers like to give you several steps to help you get finished with your research paper. So you will have things to turn in over the course of the assignment. It's always important to pay attention to the dates that you have something due so that you don't lose points on the assignment. We're still looking at that sample research assignment for the English class. Sometimes teachers will tell you exactly what topic you need to write about, but other times you'll be able to choose your topic, maybe from a list that the teacher gives. Here the teacher said to use one of the amendments to the U.S. Constitution to research. Then the students had to find a current controversy that relates to that amendment. So what do we know so far? It has to be related to one of the amendments in the Constitution, and it has to be a current controversy. And then look here. This teacher gives a list of topics that the student cannot choose. And this is a pretty long list. Now you may think that's not very fair that the teacher says you cannot write about all of those topics. Those might be topics that you're really interested in writing about. But remember, your teacher is the one who's going to grade your paper. And your teacher has graded a lot of research papers in the past. So the teacher knows what kind of topics would not make good research papers. Be sure you listen to your teacher's instructions. And notice down here the teacher tells you there are still many other topics you can choose from and even gives the students some resources to help them think. We're still looking at that research assignment. Research assignments are often several pages long because the teachers want to give you all the information about the assignment. Notice here this teacher reminds students about rules of plagiarism. You'll always want to make sure to review that so you don't make any mistakes. And then also the teacher usually gives you the information you need about grading for the research paper. Notice this paper is worth 150 points, which would be a portion of the grade for the course. This research paper has lots of different parts, and each of them are worth a few points. Students would want to make sure that they pay attention to this so that they don't lose any points if they forget to do one thing that the teacher asks them to do. Let's look at a different topic. Let's say your teacher gave you the topic of media coverage of wars. Maybe this is for a media studies class, 
or maybe it's for a sociology class. Regardless, it's a very broad topic, and you probably don't even know what that means right away. The first step would be to come up with a research question. This question would be something that interests you about the topic. Here's just an example. Are violent images appropriate for publication, like publication in a newspaper or on TV? So that question is going to guide our research. This is what we're trying to find the answer to. Let's look at another topic. This one is crime in the U.S. Again, this is a very broad topic, and you wouldn't know what to write about if your teacher just told you to write on this topic. So we come up with a research question. This example says, are three strikes laws effective in reducing crime? You may not know what a three strikes law is. This is a law in the American legal system, and it's been debated. And basically, it just means that if you are convicted of three serious crimes, then you go to jail or prison for life, usually. So this is a very complex topic and would make a good research question. And you can see that it's more specific than that general topic that we started with. Once you get your research question, it's time to start your research. To do this, you need search terms. The search terms are the words that you're going to use in the search engines to look for articles. And your search terms need to be specific. Remember the topic we started with was crime in the U.S. If you just searched for crime in the U.S., you would get too many articles. You would get thousands of articles, in fact. So you want to narrow your topic and use search terms that are more specific. This will give you better results. For this question that we're asking, we might use three strikes laws or effects of three strikes laws. We could also search three strikes reducing crime or three strikes crime reduction. You could think of dozens more search terms related to this topic. And you'll want to use all of these different search terms when you're looking for articles. If you only used one of these search terms, you might not find the articles you're looking for. The more search terms you use, the more likely you'll find good results. I'm going to talk to you about making an outline. Now this may seem obvious to some of you. Maybe you already make outlines when you write essays. But for your research paper, it's especially important to do some kind of outline and plan your essay well before you start writing. This can be done with a very informal outline, like the one shown here, where you just write your thesis statement down, and then you list the main points that you're going to make in the body paragraphs. Or you can use a more formal outline like this one here. In a formal outline, you use Roman numerals and letters to show the structure of the paragraphs. Here, Roman numeral 1 would be the introduction paragraph, and at the end of that paragraph, you would write your thesis statement. So there's space here in the outline to do that. Then each other Roman numeral would be a body paragraph, and there's room to write the topic sentence, each supporting idea, and the details and examples for each support. You could also put the quotations that you're planning to use. Notice in this formal outline, I did each body paragraph a little differently. The first body paragraph here had a quote on the first and third supports, but not on the second support. On the next body paragraph, I put a quote for the first two supports, but not for the third support. That's just random. Remember, each body paragraph should have a couple of quotations, and you can put those for whichever support you want. So know that if you download this outline template, you don't have to do the details and examples and quotes exactly the way they're shown in the outline. I've made both of these informal and formal outlines available to you, and you can download them and use them to plan your own research paper. These are Word documents, so you can edit them however you need to. It's just a good example for you to follow to make sure that your body paragraphs are well-developed 
as they should be in an academic essay. In this lecture, we're going to talk more about finding sources and about note-taking. We've already talked about the difference between popular sources and scholarly sources. On the left here are some examples of popular sources, and as we move to the right, the sources get more scholarly. On the far right, we have the most scholarly sources, the library databases, Google Scholar, and Sage Open. In the middle here are news sources. Now news sources are more scholarly than the popular sources, but not as scholarly as, say, the library databases. In college classes, your teachers may let you use news sources, or they may tell you they don't want you to use those because they're not academic enough. You'll always want to do what your teacher tells you to do. In this course, because not all of you are studying in a university right now and may not have access to library databases, I'm going to allow you to use the news sources for your academic research. If you're at a college or university and you have access to library databases, you should use those for your research. But if you don't, you'll want to use Google Scholar, and then it's okay to use some of these respected news sources. These are just some examples. There are others as well. Remember, you just always want to check to see if the source is reliable. And remember, there were several questions to check if it is reliable. Who wrote the article? Who published the article? What's their purpose? Are they biased? These are all things to consider when you're evaluating your sources. Because we're learning about academic research, I do want to show you a little bit about the library databases even though all of you won't be able to access them right now. Most college websites will also have a library website. Here's an example of a library website. This one is for the University of California, Irvine. These library web pages will be extremely helpful to you. Here in the middle, you can see lots of different databases and catalogs. These are all different ways for you to look for sources. These e-journals and databases are probably the best place to look for your online sources. These are some of the library databases that are available at most universities. You should remember these names and look for them at your school library. Some of the more popular ones are JSTOR, LexisNexis, ProQuest, and CQ Researcher. And you see they even have Google Scholar here. If you're not a student at a university, though, you won't be able to access most of these because they require a login, and you have to have an account with that university. That's why I keep telling you about Google Scholar, because if you don't have an account with a university, you can always use Google Scholar. But if you have a library account, then you'll want to use these other library databases. This is what JSTOR looks like. It looks like a search engine. There's a place for you to type in your search. And here I've typed in a sample search for free college education. I want to point out a couple of important things on this page. Notice here we're searching for all results, but we could narrow our search if we just wanted to find journals or if we just wanted to find books. You see, I've also selected content I can access. There might be some sources that I don't have access to for some reason. I don't have permission to use them. So I've asked JSTOR to just give me results for sources that I can access. And then I've also chosen to sort the results by relevance. That means how important they are to my keywords. If you wanted to just search for very new sources, you could select newest. And it would put the newest sources at the top of the list. Here's an example of the results I got from that search. You can see three sources listed here, and JSTOR has given a passage from the text that includes my keywords, and they highlighted the keywords for me. 
So this is an actual few lines from the text of this article. It allows you to read briefly and decide if this source might be what you're looking for. From this short passage, you might decide that this article, even though it mentions free college education, doesn't really have anything to do with your research question. Or you might find, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Then you would know that this is a source you probably want to take a look at. This is the first thing you would want to do when you're searching in one of the databases. And notice there are a few links below each source. You could read this article online or you could download a PDF. And there's also a link to help you with the citation. After seeing a description that I thought I was interested in, I clicked on it and this is what I see next. Here's the article title and the author's name and a little description about the author so you know who wrote this. You also get more publication information up here at the top. And different databases look a little different, but they all will have some kind of information like this. So if you learn to use one database like JSTOR, then it'll be easy to learn how to use the others. Or if you know how to use one of the others, you can figure out JSTOR. Most of them will have tools over on the side like this one does. Notice JSTOR allows you to view the PDF, you can view the citation, or you can email the citation information to yourself so you can put it in your Works Cited page later. Sometimes there's an option to email the article to yourself as well. So always look around to see what tools are available in that database. Now let's look at the rest of the article. First there is an abstract. This is just a short summary of the article that was written by the author. The abstract is a way for you to quickly decide if the article will be useful for you or not. As you can see, these academic articles are sometimes really long. We're not even halfway through this article yet. You're going to be reading dozens of articles, and it'll be difficult to remember everything in all of them. So a good idea is to take notes on the articles that you are using in your research. And here's a sample of the notes that I took for one of those articles. You see at the top I put all of the citation information. I put the title of the article I was reading. I put the journal that it came from, the date that it was published. I put that I got it from JSTOR. And I put the date that I accessed this article. I'll need all of that information in my Works Cited page. And it's hard to go back and find it later. And then below that you'll see the notes. These are just the notes from reading the article. Most of these notes are just phrases. I didn't use any complete sentences. But these are things that I will be able to remember about this article later. And I wrote down things that I think might be useful for my research paper. You'll want to do this for each of the articles that you read. Keeping notes on all of the articles will help you to be organized.
This is a lesson about 